All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Eric Zimmerman. I am Deputy, Dire Deputy Director and Transportation Director at the National Association of Regional Councils for the National Association for Regional Planning Organizations from across the country and advocate for regional solutions and regional coordination. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, today's discussion. Trail network connectivity can transform communities both by creating safe spaces to walk, bicycle and otherwise be active and by serving as catalysts for economic growth and business development at both the local and regional levels. Federal dollars provide crucial funding for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Historically, this funding has come through the Federal Surface Transportation Authorization from programs such as the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program and Transportation Alternatives Program. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act increased funding for these historic programs while also creating some new and exciting programs that support active transportation projects. We're pleased to be joined today by a great panel. El Siegel and Mary Ellen Coons from the Rails to Trails Conservancy will provide an overview of federal funding opportunities that can turn your regional and local trail dreams and visions into reality. El and Mary Ellen will discuss two new IIJA programs, the Safe Streets and Roads for All program and the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program and the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity or RAISE Discretionary Grant Program previously known as BUILD, and if you've been around long enough uh, as TIGER grants before that. Following remarks from Rails to Trails, two regional organizations will tell us about their active transportation projects. Jane Ziegler, the Senior Transportation Planner and Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator at the Indian Nation Council of Governments in Tulsa, Oklahoma, will tell us about their 22, uh, 2022 RAISE grant. And Carlos Morales, the Transportation and Data Management Manager at the Metropolitan Area Planning Agency in Omaha, Nebraska, will tell us about MAPA's SS4A grant. And before I turn things over, I would like to encourage everyone to ask questions as they come up using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. With that, I will turn things over to Mary Ellen, uh, to Mary Ellen and Elle. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Eric. My name is Mary Ellen Kuntz. I'm joining today from Rails to Trails Conservancy, where I serve as the Trail Nation Collaborative Lead, and I'm joined by El Siegel, our Director for Advocacy and Outreach. If you're not familiar, Rails to Trails Conservancy is the nation's largest advocacy organization for trails, walking, and biking, which means that we support trails and active transportation um, and, and really envision a nation connected by trails. Through this work, we have a number of programs, including Trail Nation and the Trail Nation Collaborative. Both of these work together, or the Trail Nation Collaborative works under Trail Nation to continue further supporting our network development and our trail dreams. Uh, and we today will really highlight the important role that councils of government and metropolitan planning organizations, as well as regional councils play as the planners, funders, and applicants for this type of trail network connectivity. And Elle will join us to discuss funding resources as well before we hear from our excellent partners in the field. You may be wondering why we think trail networks are such special and important things. Um, we found through our trail network or through our trail nation work that more than 135 uh, communities across the country are pursuing trail networks in order to, to achieve all of the goals that Eric mentioned earlier today and continue bringing those benefits to their communities. Through Trail Nation, we have kind of three streams that we work on at Rails to Trails Conservancy. First are our Trail Nation projects, which I'll touch on a little bit more in a moment, and our Trail Nation playbook. This serves as our interactive online tool to really bring together a variety of resources so that we can help build some efficiencies across the system. And the Trail Nation Collaborative, which is our multidisciplinary peer learning community, which takes the lessons learned from our Trail Nation projects and the playbook and takes them out into the field um, and collects best practices from everybody on this call and many other members to ensure that we are all working together and learning lessons so that we can uh, build things a little bit more quickly and more easily for us all. So among the Trail Nation projects, we have our nine sites across the country where Rails to Trails Conservancy is making pretty deep investments 
in uh, really looking to see what happens when, when we're deeply involved in trail network connectivity. So among those examples, you've got the Washington DC region, Capital Trails Coalition, Baltimore, um, a multi-state or, or two really big multi-state efforts, um, both the New England Rail Trail Network and the Industrial Heartlands Trail Coalition. Um, so you've got those really big multi-state, Baltimore is a single, single municipality, but many others work across regions and uh, usually within a footprint of a single MPO or regional council um, to achieve their goals. Through that and through the regional councils, uh, we can advance and we can see how the Trail Nation playbook comes to life. And those are the, the six elements of the playbook, including project vision, coalition building, mapping and analytics, gap filling strategy, investment strategy, and engagement. I know that all of you are deeply involved in all of this work through your roles on regional councils. And just to kind of hit it home, um, regional councils we found within the nine Trail Nation projects that um, when an MPO or regional council is deeply involved in this work, it's kind of the magic sauce. The projects we see advancing the most rapidly and the most equitably are those where the MPO is engaged. Um, there are some examples here, uh, DVRPC in the Philadelphia area, the National Capital Region, um, the, the Lower Rio Grande River Valley, uh, MPO down in Brownsville, Texas, and many others. Um, Morpsey in, in Ohio is another really good example of this, where you have the ability to, at the regional level, really kind of get in the sandbox and help advance these um, and make sure that the, the trail connectivity is happening, um, again, across that regional level and not stopping at one mun municipality's boundaries. The Industrial Heartlands Trail Coalition is a really good example of this. Um, it stretches across 52 counties in four states, um, primarily in Western Pennsylvania, um, Eastern Ohio, and West Virginia. Um, so it requires a huge amount of coordination to get the, the variety of trail projects going. Um, and in, oops, lost that side, but in Indiana County in Pennsylvania, you can see kind of how that comes together, um, as well as in the National Capital Region, uh, which is the Washington DC area here. Um, you can see on that, that uh, map on the right side that it is a sprawling area. There are a lot of trails. We're very lucky to have so many trails in the region. Um, but that also means that there are a lot of areas where there can be planned trails. You can see those planned trails in green overlaying the, the purple existing networks. So our network locally, the Capital Trails Network, um, has been in formation through a number of local partners, including Routes to Trails Conservancy for many years. Um, and the National Capital Planning Region really took on the mission of, Rails to, of um, the Capital Trails Coalition and developed it into something further and included it in our regional plans, which unlocks so many additional federal funding opportunities. It gives us, um, stronger feet to stand on really. Um, and is just a really, really important part of, of our long range transportation plan as we all work together for that. And finally, the Trail Nation Collaborative. I just wanna highlight this as a resource for you all. It's our multidisciplinary peer learning community. So we bring together audiences like you and public health uh, professionals and, and real estate and development folks and kind of uh, leaders from across sectors to share best practices, challenges, and your strategies for, accept, for success. We do that in a variety of forums, including monthly dialogues, in-person events, virtual discussion groups, and our uh, unveiling some new technical assistance opportunities soon. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elle. Hi everyone, my name is Elle Siegel. Um, I am the Advocacy Outreach Director at Rails to Trials based in Washington, DC. Uh, it's great to virtually meet you all. Uh, if you wanna click a couple times, Mary Ellen, so things kind of pop up here. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, federal funding, um, mostly focused on uh, what came out of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, so as a lot of you are aware, bipartisan infrastructure law or IIJA, uh, passed in 2021. Um, within that, there's historic funding for trails. 
Um, we have new and existing uh, programs, some new policies for some existing programs. I'm going to dive into a lot of that, but just want to indicate that early rounds of the funding that we've seen have really supported trails and bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So we've been really thrilled to see this. And this is really a once in a generation opportunity to uh, invest in and build out uh, the, the dreams that, that Eric kind of alluded to for, for building out trail networks. So one example, which we're gonna dive into more hearing from uh, Jane about RAISE than the RAISE grant. Uh, in 2023, our analysis showed that $400 million just in 2023 uh, went to projects solely focused on bicycle and pedestrian or trail infrastructure. So that's a huge amount of investment going uh, to communities. Uh, and then another great example or, or sort of statistic to highlight is 80% of projects that received funding in 2023 under RAISE um, had uh, bicycle and pedestrian elements associated with those projects. So again, just a huge amount of support uh, for some of these uh, competitive programs going towards trails. Uh, next slide, please. So Mary Ellen, you can just kind of start going through everything. So uh, there's a huge amount of eligible opportunities uh, for trails. So uh, these are gonna be programs that are not solely focused on trails and active transportation, but have eligibility. Um, so I'm not gonna talk in detail about out all of these, um, but I'll, I'll just kind of flag a few things here. So uh, RAISE, we're going to talk more about with, with Jane, uh, formerly Tiger and Build, that's going to give you some large scale opportunities to invest. There's planning grants, there's also construction grants, um, formerly Tiger Build. So I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with that program. And we're, again, just thrilled to see so much support uh, going from that program to uh, trails and bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, reconnecting communities, uh, that NOFO just closed a couple days ago. So hopefully a lot of you applied, but that's really about reconnecting communities uh, and, and combating, dis, um, combating divisive infrastructure. Um, and again, hopefully a lot of you applied. Happy to chat more uh, if you're gearing up to apply next year. Um, a few others to flag. The Protect Grant is something that's new, really focused on resiliency. Uh, would encourage folks to think about that when they're thinking about sort of climate resiliency and how trails and active transportation can play a role in that. Um, and then I'm going to zoom in a little more closely looking at uh, two additional new programs, the Safe Streets and Roads for All program and then the Carbon Reduction program. So I'll have some slides there. And again, Safe Streets and Roads for All, we're going to hear from Carlos uh, a bit more about that. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the uh, implementation grants as opposed to the action grants. So if you can click one more time, Mary Ellen. And I just want to flag that we have a comprehensive uh, funding uh, website that uh, tracks NOFOs, that uplifts information, has case studies. Uh, so I'd encourage you guys to, to go on there and, and see us as a resource and partner as you're uh, trying to figure out what, what funding is available for your projects. Next slide, please. So just quickly looking at safe streets and roads for all. Uh, again, we're going to go over that in a little more detail with Carlos's uh, project. Um, but I wanted to flag this is $5 billion really focused for both planning and implementation grants, um, focused on uh, preventing injuries that occur on roadways. And I think something that's really important to emphasize is that uh, connected active transportation networks should really be part of any comprehensive safety strategy. So rather than just looking at sort of specific crash sites, um, really having having a sort of comprehensive view of how um, active transportation plays a role in safety, uh, we've seen we've seen that be valued in applications, and we really think it should be a priority. Um, and again, another great statistic here to to flag um, from the 2022 awards the um, the uh, implementation grants, I should say, 46% uh, of safe streets and roads for all construction grants funded projects that included elements of traffic separated connectivity. So again, kind of bringing that that uh, that emphasis in around um, connected active transportation and uh, traffic separated safety. Um, and then we're gonna hear from uh, INCOG in a sec, but just wanted to flag that INCOG was one of the uh, COGS that received an implementation grant for safety and roads for all in 2022. So uh, there's definitely the opportunity for COGS and MPOs to take advantage of this funding. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the 2024 NOFO is anticipated in the spring. Uh, so 
you know, it's it's still a, a few months out, but we really encourage you to begin working on it now. One of the reasons I wanted to flag this is because it is an upcoming opportunity and uh, trails and active transportation have done really well under this program in the in the first uh, cycle. So we'd really encourage you to consider applying, um, whether it be for an action planning grant, uh, which, you know, Carlos will talk a little bit more about or an implementation grant, depending on your needs. Uh, next slide. The Carbon Reduction Program is another project I wanted to flag uh, with eligibility for Trails and Active Transportation. Um, it is a state administered program and really designed around reducing emissions. Um, there's also a strategy component to this. So uh, the state DOTs in, cons in, in consultation with, with you all uh, are developing strategies on carbon reduction um, and those are due in November. So uh, if you haven't heard anything about this, I'd encourage you to potentially reach out to your colleagues at the state DOT to see if there's an opportunity for you to weigh in. Um, an important thing about the carbon reduction program here is that 65% of the funds are sub-allocated based on population size. And so MPOs and COGS have a huge role to play in making decisions based on that funding because it's it's the large amount of it is, is going to be allocated uh, based on population size. Um, and importantly, anything that's eligible for transportation alternatives is eligible for CRP. So we've been really thrilled to see uh, some DOTs just solely moving moving their funding directly into transportation alternatives. We've also seen some MPOs like Metro Plan use CRP funds uh, to develop trails directly, recognizing that trails and active transportation have a huge role in reducing emissions. So um, would encourage you to, to uh, consider you know, trails and active transportation as, as a huge part of this, given that 65% of the funds will be uh, in your hands. So next slide. So those are the the, the um, eligible opportunities. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about the dedicated uh, funding opportunities as well. Um, so there's three that I wanted to flag for our dedicated funding opportunities. Transportation alternatives, which a lot of you are familiar with, but there's some new and exciting changes. Uh, the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, or ATIP for short, which is um, a new program and we'll, we'll flag in a bit. Um, and then recreational trails. I'm not, I'm not really going to talk much about recreational trails because uh, it hasn't really changed since the bipartisan infrastructure has passed. It's still an incredibly important resource, but uh, there haven't been any changes to, to highlight. So next slide, please. So transportation alternatives, there's some key updates to flag. You know, as a reminder, there's 10 eligibilities for this, but 95 plus percent of this funding goes to pedestrian and, and bicycle infrastructure and trails. Uh, this is still the largest funding source for, for trails across the country. Um, and we were really excited under the bipartisan infrastructure law to see some key updates. So one of the big uh, things to highlight, 70% more, mo more money for TA. So that has a huge impact on the ground just to see that amount of money available. Um, we're also seeing two new policy updates that I wanted to really emphasize here. So TA is now eligible for maintenance, which is uh, really helpful before it was just recreational trails and now maintenance is an eligible use for TA. So definitely keep that in mind um, and consider that in, in plans. Um, and then 5% of technical assistance, 5% of funding is available for technical assistance. Um, that's mostly through the DOTs, but it's helpful to think about how you can support communities uh, in applying for federal funds. Um, and then I also wanted to flag, we have a, a big resource for you all when it comes to transportation alternatives. Uh, we have our transportation alternatives data exchange, which I, I have a link to below. And then we also have an annual white paper that we produce uh, called the Transportation Alternatives Spending Report. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check both of those out. There's going to be a lot more information on TA uh, and how, how states are administering funds. Next slide. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this new exciting program called the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. Kind of a mouthful, uh, but ATIP for short. Um, importantly, ATIP was authorized as part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, so uh, or IIJA. Um, so it, it was authorized there and it received an initial $45 million in 2023. Um, the emphasis of ATIP is it's it's dedicated for trails and the emphasis is really on networks and connectivity. So everything that Mary Ellen was, was talking about around trail networks, 
around uh, connectivity around a lot of the networks we're seeing either planned and or people are starting to build them. Um, ATIP is going to be an, a really great funding source for that. Probably more on the planning side, just given the, the 45 million addition, initial uh, funding to kickstart the program. But importantly, I want to flag that we are advocating uh, to increase that funding to 200 million in 2024 and 2025, which was the amount that was actually authorized in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So we're fighting tooth and nail as an advocacy organization to do that. I know you all are probably limited in what you can do to help us with that, but just wanted to flag that increasing that funding uh, to 200 million can have a huge impact. Again, this would be dedicated funding, uh, you know, $20 million project type things, $20 million for projects type of type of investment that we would be able to see should we get that uh, increased uh, to $200 million. And importantly, a NOFO should be released later this year, likely in the coming weeks. So we will be uh, highlighting that tremendously when it when it is available. Next slide. And then I think this is my last slide. Um, I just want to flag some funding and tools and resources for you are for you all uh, to you continue to, you know, help have us help you. Uh, so rails trails.org slash funding. Uh, there's going to be a lot of resources on federal funding, case studies, NOFO tracking, all of those uh, important things to make sure that you're prepared. Uh, we also have a new federal funding tool where you type in some information, kind of answer a few questions about your project, and uh, you can get a potential match, uh, potential uh, good source for, for uh, your project as far as funding. So it's sort of a matching tool. Um, so with that, I think that's my last slide, and I will hand things over uh, to uh, Carlos. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's okay. So I'm Carlos Barrales, the Transportation Data Manager over at MAPA. MAPA is the Metropolitan Area Planning Agency for uh, the Omaha Council Bluffs Metro Region. Next slide, please. So a little background on what MAPA is. MAPA serves many, many functions, one of which is a council of governments with 29 members across six counties with a nine member board of directors. Basically on the left-hand side, you see uh, the counties represented in our COG for the Nebraska side, uh, which include Washington, Douglas, Sarpy, and Cass County. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see Pottawatomie and Mills, which is our Iowa side and contingency. Next slide. As I said, we do serve many different roles. One of the roles isn't just the COG, but it's also the MPO for the region uh, and the TMA. So our TMA boundary includes the counties of Douglas and Sarpy County in Nebraska and the urbanized area in Pottawatomie County in Iowa. So we're a fun little um, mix of uh, two states, several counties, and a bunch of different cities in and around this area. So today I've been asked to speak about our experience and our personal growth experience uh, applying for Safe Streets for All. Next slide. And so a little background, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, it's one of these discretionary grant opportunities uh, that really was looking and is looking to address local communities and local road safety. I think one of the things that struck us uh, primarily when we started looking and applying was the sheer focus of locality with this. Unlike traditional safety funds, which have been controlled by state and state agencies, this kind of provided a direct uh, federal investment to local communities. So that was kind of the very first thing that we noticed that the states were not eligible to apply, which is kind of interesting. Um, if you've been in the transportation world, you would think that is pretty interesting the first time you saw it. And so what is it fun? Like they said, uh, it's really looking at developing comprehensive safety action plans, supplemental planning activities, and implementation. Uh, the first year we applied for a comprehensive safety action plan. Next slide. And in the process of applying and following all the guidance and rules from the uh, USDLT, we learned a good bit of things along the way. Uh, the actual application process really honed in on what was important to our community and looking at the numbers, not just uh, safety concentrated along a corridor, but what it means for our region. And 
this kind of interesting look at it, instead of normalizing through vehicle miles traveled, which is a traditional way that we normalize crashes, had us look at our crash rates based on population and census tracts, which kind of cleared and opened a new opportunity as we engage in equity work within our region. And so as you can see, some of the things that we were learning by applying was the concentration of equity and equitable uh, distribution of crashes within our region. Uh, next slide. So what this amounts to is that in our disadvantaged communities that make up 13% of the total population within our region, they're disproportionately harmed by traffic and uh, crashes and fatalities. And so that really clarified and allowed us to engage uh, with our partners and understand the problem in a new, in a different way than our traditional, well, there's a lot of crashes and we want to fix it. Well, there's also an equity component that we're trying to look at this that really impacts our entirety of our region. Uh, so that um, going through the process, right? Having a clear eye towards understanding why we have to do all this for the application really helped us hone in on our narrative, how we were able to engage with our local partners and local community members, how we were able to attract new uh, partners into this conversation and into this uh, foray into safety and safety action planning uh, within the region. And I think the other aspect behind this is one of the requirements behind Safe Streets and Roads for All is that once a community or an area has a certified or a safety action plan, they're eligible to apply for implementation dollars. And I think that is also very interesting because it's a new injection of uh, dollar, safety dollars uh, towards infrastructure and infrastructure development. Uh, and so that, again, very interesting, since we're not going through the state uh, and having to meet some high uh, benefit cost ratios for highway safety improvement programs, this kind of lowers that threshold, makes it very localized, and provides that extra incentive. Hey, join us and let's work out where the safety problems are in our narrative so that we could also access these implementation funds later on. Next slide. So <laughs> based on that narrative, we were able to collect all these different uh, letters of support that were fully supportive of our vision and our goal to reduce traffic fatalities within our region by 2040. Uh, so we kind of went whole steam and had our board uh, decide on our goal of uh, zero fatal and severe crashes within the region by 2040. It was a lot more aggressive, very aggressive for a very large region and a very large area. And people signed on and believed in it. Next slide. And so, end result, we were awarded a planning grant. We're in the middle of um, developing or getting started, as you will, uh, with this. And we included Douglas and Sarpy County and the urbanized areas in um, Pottawatomie County on the Iowa side. And we're really gonna split it up into data support and understanding. So we're trying to unlock and develop data congruencies between the two states. So how the states capture uh, traffic safety and data, having that kind of be a little bit more uniform to present a uniform uh, data structure is really important to us, trying to get our local jurisdictions to understand the importance of data and how we uh, address those data discrepancies is also super important. And then a lot of outreach and engagement about uh, planning action uh, safety grants, right? Next slide. So <clears throat> here's a, a little bit of a timeline where we're at. We're kind of starting to kicking off. Our RFPs are on the ground. One of the lessons learned is that um, the main reason I put this slide is even though we were awarded back in fiscal year 2022, uh, after getting all the negotiations and all the contracts with FHWA, et cetera, et cetera, it could be a lengthy process. So be prepared for that. 
be prepared for multiple, multiple rounds of reviews for uh, contract agreements um, because it has taken quite a bit of time, about six to seven months, I want to say, uh, since we were notified of the award period, which is actually very extremely fast. I think the original assumption uh, when we did receive the award notification was that the actual contract negotiations were going to take up to a year, a year and a half. Uh, so that means a year and a half before you're able to start doing work or putting any of your RFQs out to bid. And so that's also a good lesson learned. It does go a little bit quicker. And as these things start rolling out, it's pretty amazing. Uh, next slide. And so some of the keys to our success uh, for this six streets and roads for all, unlike uh, traditional discretionary grants like RACE or some of the other implementation grants, uh, the planning side, the action planning side did not include any benefit cost ratios, which is kind of interesting and fun to see. It was a very narrative focused application. And so I think the max in the application process is about a two page narrative a story map with some of the criteria kind of spelled out how to list the criteria for um, equity and bars data, et cetera, et cetera. And through the process, you get to learn quite a bit about your community and the communities you're representing. So it was really good to see all this focus on mapping and looking at some of the safety data that was currently available to look at the holistic picture of where some of the key narratives and where the key concerns are within the community. So if you applied or been in the transportation game for a while, you'll note that the, these are very interesting and nuanced ways uh, for these discretionary grants to get out, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, next slide. I think some of the key things that we learned looking back was a lot of this stuff in the very first year, USDOT did a tremendous push to have webinars about how to apply, how to fill out all the forms. And that guidance is still available and relevant. And I listed the um, website there for your information. If you're really curious about it, go to the website, get prepared, understand what you're getting into and understand what you're needing to do uh, so that you can be prepared to apply for these. Again, I think the last round, when I looked at the 2022 awarded projects of the 450 plus MPOs in the US, about 200 or so had applied and received action planning grants. Uh, so there's potential opportunity for more to apply uh, and a good way to kind of leverage and get yourself actuated so that you can invest in the infrastructure and the comprehensive safety action uh, development within the infrastructure side. Um, a couple of switches uh, to note, uh, we originally applied through grants.gov, which has now changed to valid eval. Uh, I'll reserve some judgment on that because they are both a little bit different. Uh, we were just used to grants.gov, but valid eval is a interesting new curb uh, into the mix of the application. Sign up and get secured with your login right away and as quickly as possible. I think that's been a trip up for some folks, uh, not being able to sign up early enough. Uh, it just takes a while to receive your SAM uh, ID number, uh, your login credentials. Just air, early warning, err on the side of caution. If you know you're going to apply for these things, make sure you have, uh, you're registered for them. Uh, and then I think internally for us, looking back retrospectively, uh, the whole story map and the mapping process was very enlightening and brought in a nuance that we hadn't experienced within our region before. Uh, and so that kind of gave us that extra push and that extra incentive to push forward with this project uh, as it related to two of the main goals that we're really trying to hone in on within our region which is ultimately providing safe, connected networks so that people could make the healthy choice, the easy choice, um, and equity. And so that's kind of what uh, brought us all together here. Uh, I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do and that we've seen within our region is 
uh, this disparity between uh, speed and um, slower moving vehicles or our vulnerable road users, how that has a tremendous impact and how we could dial in on additional network connections to non-motorized transportation uh, to meet multiple uh, goals, including equity, economic uh, incentives, and actually providing different options for a lot of people. So we're really thrilled. We're happy about this grand new adventure. And if you have additional questions, uh, I'll be around. Thanks. Thanks, Carlos. Appreciate that. And finally, we have Jane. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, so my name is Jane Ziegler, and I work for the Indian Nations Council of Governments. Uh, I'm a senior transportation planner. We are the MPO for the Tulsa region. Um, so there's a map there on your screen. Uh, Tulsa is located in the northeast corner of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so I've been asked uh, by Rails to Trails Conservancy to join you guys today to um, share a little bit uh, about our RAISE project and any tips NCOG can provide for a successful outcome. The location of the Tulsa Jinx uh, multimodal safety project that was awarded um, is, uh, it's, um, along the Arkansas River that does run through the state of Oklahoma. Uh, and if you can see, it's in the white little circle on the map in the middle. Uh, so it includes both uh, the cities of Tulsa and Jinx. And before I get into details about the project, uh, I wanted everyone on this call to know that we did submit this three times, this project. Uh, once under build and twice under raise. So the third time's the charm. Uh, some advice I can give is don't give up. Uh, always schedule a debrief um, on all of our uh, discretionary, uh, federal discretionary grant projects we submit. Um, I know that we are always scheduling those debriefs um, because you can get some good info about that if you wish to resubmit uh, the next year. Uh, and I will say NCOG has been successful uh, in the past uh, managing the grant application process for our regional partners. Um, and we've been co-applicants um, on successful projects. But this RAISE grant, this was awarded to us in August of 2022. So this was the first uh, USDOT discretionary grant uh, awarded directly to NCOG to manage it as the MPO. Um, I think it was uh, Elle that showed on her um, screen previously. Um, after a few months after this grant, we were also um, awarded an implementation uh, Safe Streets for All project. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the um, there's two major components of this project that we were awarded. Uh, the first component um, are Riverside Parkway Safety Enhancements, um, and that's on the small map in the middle of your screen. And um, this was to uh, complete sidewalk gaps uh, on a major um, north-south arterial, um, enhance ADA access, uh, traffic signal coordination, and uh, pedestrian countdown. Uh, and this was to help uh, residents uh, that live on the east side of the river, or excuse me, east side of Riverside Parkway to um, have better access to um, the existing trail, but then also um, this planned trail that we were funded. Uh, component two of this project is to um, construct seven miles of multi-use trails um, that using specific um, NCOG design standards. Um, so any trail project that the NCOG, the MPO is involved with, uh, we have a specific set of trail design standards that we like to see. Um, all right, so um, 
one um, suggestion I would give for a successful project is to tell your story. So everyone has a unique story to tell. Um, our particular project, uh, it is multi-jurisdictional and as explained earlier, um, maybe I think Mary Ellen stated it, that MPOs um, and regional councils um, do a great job at um, and excel at multi-jurisdictional projects. This particular one, the local match uh, for the project, the funding match uh, came from the cities of um, Jinx and Tulsa. Uh, this project also involves uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, the um, Oklahoma Department of Transportation, Oklahoma Turnpike Authority, um, River Parks Authority, which is an authority of uh, Tulsa County and the city of Tulsa, uh, and then also um, Tulsa County uh, is involved in this project. Uh, what is also um, unique about this project is that the entirety of it is located within the Muskogee Creek Nation uh, reservation boundaries. Um, Let's see, I, you know, in addition to um, all of those entities I just listed, uh, this project also has um, great uh, community support. Uh, we received uh, letters of support from uh, the health department. Um, if you do not receive letters of support from your health departments on any of your projects, uh, I would highly suggest that. Uh, chambers of Commerce, we had um, both Tulsa Regional Chamber and the Jinx Chamber of Commerce um, sign letters of support um, because of this project, um, there will be some uh, economic development components to it. Uh, we also received letter of support from Jinx Public Schools. Um, they have, um, this project touches um, a couple of their school campuses. Um, we also received a letter of support from uh, this machine, which is Tulsa's nonprofit bike share, uh, in addition to some private developers. Um, we received letters of support from them. Uh, our letters of support that INCOG submits, um, they are all unique letters. They are not generic or fill in the blank letters. And maybe perhaps that's um, partly on me. I am um, admit that I am uh, a little bit picky when it comes to letters of support, uh, just from, um, you know, being involved um, in all aspects of grant uh, cycles from the uh, application to, you know, even internally reviewing some local grants. Uh, we like to see what is unique about each individual or organization that supports this. So, like I said, um, Jinx Public Schools, they want this trail because it will connect um, two of their campuses. And right now uh, the kids have to get in a car to drive um, from campus to campus um, because there's no safe pedestrian connection. So in your letters of support, have something that's unique about each individual supporting organization instead of just a form letter that people sign at the bottom. Uh, next uh, part of your story, uh, there should be um, a safety component to it. Um, this particular uh, project, um, the current way to connect from one regional park down to um, let's see, downtown Jinx is on a two lane road with no shoulders. Uh, there's the photo there um, that you see on your screen. So uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And what's, um, I'm sure all of you probably get into um, Google Maps or, or Google Earth every day. And it's really crazy the um, what the cameras catch on screen. So this here, um, this was a Google, um, a Google Maps um, photo from from that one. Uh, this project it also has um, there's history of fatalities um, along um, the corridor of this project. 
Um, then one thing I would also note as um, the current administration in Washington, uh, their focus is on vulnerable road users. And so when you write your grant, um, write the application that focuses on the administration's uh, priorities. Like I said, we previously submitted this um, as a build grant and with the uh, change of administration, um, obviously the NOFO changed. And so uh, make sure that you read that NOFO and that the project you choose aligns with the uh, priorities of the NOFO. Um, I don't have it listed here, but um, equity is um, a focus of this administration, uh, which is really awesome. Uh, when you write your grant, I would suggest reviewing uh, USDOT's Justice 40 web maps to find out if your project is uh, located in uh, one of the highlighted areas on the Justice 40 web map. Um, the entirety of this project uh, is in fact located uh, within an um, underserved community as defined by uh, USDOT. Um, let's see, and um, lastly, I would suggest um, choosing a project that is um, in existing plans. This particular trail alignment was in 10, it's, it's been in 10 adopted plans since 1999. So this was not a project that, that you know, we sat around the round table, um, you know, a couple of years ago and said, we want to have this project. Um, this has been in the works for a while. There's been a lot of talks about it. So for example, when talking to um, the Corps of Engineers that were submitting this project, they've known about this project forever. Uh, well, since 1999. And so it, it wasn't a surprise. Um, to them. And so that that helps um, when you choose projects that have been adopted and have been in the public realm uh, for quite a while. So I think those are my quick um, suggestions of a successful project. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Eric for questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Thanks to all the speakers. That was a lot of amazing information uh, there. And uh, we do have some time for, for a few questions. I know folks have been typing a little bit, some answers there. I'll go through a couple of those for Jane's sake, uh, since she was not uh, able to type and speak at the same time. Um, but there, there has been somebody very patiently waiting. Ellen, if you're still uh, available to ask your question, I'm going to allow you to talk now. You can unmute and ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, I am with a city council uh, <clears throat> of a city within Salt Lake County, of course, the main county in Utah. And um, what, of course, I've learned is that so many of the, the grant opportunities uh, prior to SS4A, um, and even with, uh, as I understood it, your description of the ATIP, uh, they're so uh, regional. Uh, whereas within each city, not only, uh, for instance, in our city, uh, we have a lot of last mile issues for those uh, who need to use either transit or they want to use active transportation. Uh, they can't even, you know, get to where the bus stops are. Um, our, our, we do have a, a little bit of a regional, uh, it's called the Mid Valley uh, Regional Active Transportation Plan. And, but, it, but as far as my city goes of 33,000 people, um, the uh, Mid Valley uh, plan uh, really comes to the edge of one of our uh, fast moving, uh, completely unsafe arterials uh, through the main part of our city. And then, and then our, then we've created, I should say, our, our staff has created like uh, 48 uh, projects that are um, do not appear in the Mid Valley uh, Transportation Plan. So I don't mean to tell you so much, but we all know this is a complicated subject. We do have an MPO, um, uh, the Wasatch Front Regional Council, um, but um, 
I'm finding the, their emphasis, of course, is regional. The governor's interest is these regional trails, which go between cities or vast distances. Um, but really, to get people having a healthy lifestyle and walking, they need to be able to leave their driveway and get to, uh, you know, safe places uh, on their low, you know, like I'm really into the neighborhood byways. So could you, could anybody talk uh, to uh, how much uh, these grant, any of these, and I, I assume it's only SS4A, but I'm really interested in how, where do we spend our time and energy going after grants that can fix things within our city boundaries, uh, as opposed to all these building of off-road trails, which are delightful, but I'm interested in neighborhood byways and helping people to stay off of those unsafe arterials and collectors. Could Thanks, someone Ellen. speak to that? Thank you. I'll take a quick stab. Uh, representing the local MPO in my region, uh, part of what we fund is as a TMA and MPO for the state of Nebraska and Iowa, we receive uh, direct federal funding for SCBG, TAP, and now uh, Congestion Reduction Program, CRP. We have our own call for our regional area. And so that's where locals can apply for some of these uh, funding opportunities. Again, not every situation is a federal funding situation. I'd like to tell our local community members, look, if you're going to apply or try to do a $20,000 project, federal funding may not be the best solution for that. Um, because of all the additional thresholds and things that you would have to do uh, to fulfill that uh, opportunity. I think, and taking it back to Safe Streets for All, Safe Streets for All, you don't necessarily need a regional plan. You could go at it from a regional perspective, but local agencies are also allowed to um, develop their own safety action plans. If that is an actual interest, I would highly encourage you to apply in the next cycle and look for uh, first last mile safety connections if that makes sense for your community. Uh, I do understand that you know the local call for projects, it's another source. Um, it might be set up a little bit differently in your region, but traditionally when we use state resources for state TAP funding, uh, those are mainly for our big regional projects we tend to use our localized funding for local and areas of civic importance within our region. But that's what I have. <laughs> thank you. I, I also just want to add, thank you, Ellen, for the question. Um, yeah, Safe Seats and Roads for All, I think it'd be great. But also, you know, we've seen cities received, you know, raise grants, things of that nature. Like the, I mean, they're they're slightly larger, you know, like the city of Birmingham received a raise grant. Um, there's there's many other cities. Uh, city of Conway, Arkansas comes to mind. Um, I, these are just kind of random places, but um, I wouldn't shy away. I mean, it really depends on the needs of your project. Um, and I also, you know, this is about federal funding, but uplifting Utah just passed, I think, $45 million for active transportation, uh, the state did. So uh, I would pursue state funding as well, because there's going to be different, uh, maybe fewer limitations uh, on, on that are a little bit less complicated. So thank you. And I can I can just chime in on kind of the, the planning side of it, less the funding side. Um, all the networks that we've kind of talked about today have networks within those networks too. And figuring out the best approach and that might like regional trails, neighborhood byways. Uh, I think of all of them as like a variety of different types of trails and, and low stress modes. Um, low stress infrastructure. So just thinking through kind of what that looks like in, in your very specific context and, and the best approach for that, um, while the MPO is also kind of thinking more largely at that regional level to provide connections between the neighborhoods and between the communities themselves often. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of really great models of, of all of those things very happily coexisting in the infrastructure. Thank you. Great, thanks for the question, Ellen. Um, another question came in, it says, our local governments are often afraid of federalizing their trail projects. Is there an effort to understand why and to try to address those issues with both USDOT and federal legislature, legislators? 
I'll maybe try to take a stab at that without knowing the local context uh, of that question. Um, yeah, always be, um, I think Ellen, kind of back to your question, answer that too, is um, when you receive any sort of federal funding, whether it's TAP or RAISE or Safe Streets for All, uh, you are federalizing that project with that goes uh, um, into the NEPA process, uh, which is the environmental process. Uh, so that does take a bit longer. Um, you know, I, I think that there have been some really great projects funded through these large discretionary grants, but if the timeline of your local community doesn't allow for um, just throwing this out there, every single project is unique, but if you're awarded a raise grant, you're, for example, NCOG was awarded a raise grant in August of 2022. Uh, we are still go, um, we still don't have a uh, grant agreement with Federal Highway um, because it just takes a very long time. And if you want a trail in three years, it's probably best if you find local funding for that. So maybe that's why um, your local community doesn't want to federalize it. Yeah, and I, I think I'll chime in with some of our experiences. I think part of it is some states and jurisdictions, the actual agency that's making the decision on your NEPA documents may not be as familiar with the type of project you're trying to implement. Uh, so traditionally, like a lot of bikeway and uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure classifies as a 3C exception for NEPA. Um, but some states don't necessarily recognize that and kind of take you through a very, very detailed view of uh, how to get through NEPA. And so I think part of that is kind of discussing with your state agencies or your resource agencies about how to streamline that process for your local agency. I know we in our region still have that problem as well. It does take time. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I think we are uh, right here at the top of the hour. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists today. What a great conversation. So much wonderful information. Uh, thanks to everybody that joined us. Some great questions and back and forth. And uh, so, so happy to, to have this conversation here today. So thanks so much. And we'll see you all soon.